George Oss joined the Luther Seminary faculty in 1939 and taught until 1973. He served several parishes prior to coming to Luther Seminary and served as pastor of the American Congregation in Oslo, Norway, 1960 to 1962. Dr. Oss was known as a superb teacher using the inductive approach to theology. He fully believed in the living God and his life reflected his living faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. He was faithful in his service to the church as leader, preacher, and evangelist and was steadfast in his loyalty to the confessions and traditions of the church, and was sought out as friend and counselor. Upon his death, the Oss Memorial Lecture Series was initiated by faculty members to honor his theological teaching and evangelical fervor. Previous lecturers of the Oss Lecture include Dr. James Burtness, Dr. Craig Kester, Dr. Rolf Jacobson, Dr. Thomas Long, Dr. Roger Olson, Dr. Kendra Creasy-Dean, and Dr. Perry Rosalind Dreiben. And now to that list, we get to add Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, who will be introduced by Dr. Robin Stanky. Thank you, Michael. Michael is our, uh, one of our distinguished professors of Old Testament. So my, Michael, thank you for that introduction. It is my singular delight to introduce to you our guest of honor this evening and our distinguished speaker. Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown is the historiographer and executive director of research and scholarship for the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She also serves as professor of homiletics at the Candler School of Theology and the director of black studies at Emory University in Atlanta. Now, I have to tell you, I started my seminary journey taking a couple of courses at Candler School of Theology in Atlanta. And when I was there, there were no women African-American tenured professors. That has changed. For the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown was appointed the Distinguished Bandy Chair in Preaching at Candler, making her the first black and the first woman to hold the most prestigious preaching position in America. That was amazing. She earned her PhD in religious and theological studies from the Isle of School of Theology and the University of Denver, with an emphasis in religion and social transformation. She has extensive teaching and preaching in both national and international academic and ecumenical settings. She leads workshops and seminars in black church studies, church administration and leadership, African-American health and family issues, ministerial relationships, voice and diction and worship. But that's not all. <laughs> she is a prolific author. And if I were to read even a sampling of her work, we would be here for the rest of the evening. But I want to highlight a couple that follow from our uh, wonderful lectures earlier this afternoon. She has a book out called Weary Throats and New Song, Black Women Proclaiming God's Word. Another book, Delivering the Sermon, Voice, Body, and Animation in Proclamation. And one of my favorite titles, Can a Sister Get a Little Help? <laughs> Advice and Encouragement for Black Women in Ministry. She is an ordained itinerant elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church and an associate minister at New Bethel AME in Lithonia, Georgia. She's a native of Independence, Missouri. And she notes that her life is guided by the words of the prophet Isaiah. Those whose hope is in the Lord gain new strength. Will you join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry?
blessed of the Lord to be able to stand here. I thank all the many persons, the Aus family, and the president, the dean, the provost, everybody, as Bishop Berg used to say, everybody who is somebody in the house tonight. I thank you for being present. And uh, I stressed about this lecture. I really stressed about this lecture. I, I preach and do a lot of lectures, but when I received the letter, uh, if you're like most authors, once you write something, you don't look at it for a long time because it was so painful writing it in the first place. You don't want to revisit it. And uh, so I don't read my work after about a year. I don't read it. And so when the letters mentioned that I uh, wanted to hear something about weary throats and new songs, it got to me a little bit. And so I had to go back and review what I had done because it had been so long ago, and now last week is long ago. I began my research in 2000 on black women preachers and their preaching methodology. I had been at that time in ministry for 18 years, and the academy and the church seemed to me to be somewhat mute uh, or victims of selective amnesia when it came to black women's preaching. There had been several books on black women's history, an occasional collection of black women's sermons from the 18th and 19th century in the form of spiritual narratives and Dr. Ella Mitchell's seminal work, Those Preaching Women. And there'd been collections of sermons by black males that took on what black preaching was supposed to be like, but still women seemed to be like problematic stepchildren. They existed in the marginalized liminal spaces of the church there. Their work was present on Women's Days in some denominations and on Educational Sunday or in Children's Church. Even though 70 to 95 percent of the membership of black churches were women, it seemed as if they had to be quiet because they might embarrass someone. Only the spaces by preaching anyway, only some of the women preached anyway or in the midst of questions about their sexuality, their fitness for motherhood, the accusations of destroying the family, taunts of taking jobs away from men, swept out of pulpits, ordered to speak from the floor, forcibly driven from churches, but they proclaimed God's word anyway. So let me just be a little bit open right now. Most of this stuff happened to me. And I usually write books when I'm tired of hearing about something. And so that, that stimulates me to write something. So every one of my books is about some experience that I've been uh, with because your, your, your books become like your children. And so that's what it came from. So what I'd like to talk to, to with you tonight, and we're going to, I usually like to have an interaction when I'm presenting, so the mics are there, so when I finally stop talking, you can ask questions and we'll have some exchange. So I'd like to talk about tearful, tireless, transformative testimonies of black women proclaiming God's word. Tearful, tireless transformative testimonies of black women proclaiming God's word. So I enter this uh, presentation from my own social location. So when I'm speaking, I'm speaking for Teresa. As a former speech language pathologist, a doctoral studies, as you've heard, in religion and social transformation, the author and researcher in homiletics and black church studies and black women's studies, I'm an ordained itinerant clergy, uh, an executive director in, in a predominantly African-American diaspora denomination founded on religious and social political protests. So a lot of my work is about protests. A participant in faith families for 64 years. No, I don't mind telling you how old I am because I'm blessed every second that I breathe. I'm a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a great-grandmother, and a mentor. And I've been a preaching professor at Candler School of Theology for 21 years. So in our lecture tonight, I'd like to talk, because I'm a historian, about what preaching is from my particular perspective as a black woman, a brief historical background because I believe, as my grandmother taught me, you don't know where you are unless you know where you've been. So we're going to talk a little bit about historical kinds of bases for black women who are preaching. Then a little bit about what happened in Weary Throats and New Songs, and then looking at black women's hermeneutical foundations for using biblical texts in the preaching moment. And finally, a proposal that I've started working on about 11 years ago which is a womanist homiletical model for prophetic preaching. So I start with this quote. I quote, God is inside of you and inside everyone else. 
You come into the world with God, but only them that search for it inside find it. And sometimes it just manifests itself even if you're not looking or don't know what you're looking for. Trouble, do it for most folks, I think. Sorrow, Lord. Feeling that, and I can't use the word because it's a seminary. You'll look it up and you'll find out what the word is. <laughs> Feeling some way. <laughs> I believe God is everything, everything that is or ever was or will be. And when you feel like that, you'd be happy that you feel like that because you found it more than everything else. God loves affirmation. These are the words of the protagonist, Shug Avery, in Alice Walker's seminal novel, The Color Purple. And it seems to me that's what preaching just might be about, admiration for God. So when I look at my definition of preaching, I start talking about preaching as this purposeful presentation of the Word of God. That regardless of the translation that we use verbally and non-verbally, vocally and non-vocally, the presence, the power, the passion, the purpose, the listener, the observer, the senses that are impacted with the perceived truth, the impulse for change and conversion of your life is all that preaching can be. It's the marriage of God's word and human creativity that can be a symphony of hope and healing or a dirge of defeat and depression, depending on the skill and intent of the orator. It's a holy speech. And I think contemporarily sometimes we forget that preaching is about holy speech because people just do self-stimulation and entertain themselves instead of understanding it's about admiration for God. It's the word of God that's proclaimed and announced concerning some contemporary, often contradictory kind of issue toward the ultimate response to God. It's priestly and it's prophetic. It must be well researched. There's nothing worse than a lazy preacher that doesn't put in the work. It must be well researched and carefully crafted and intentionally delivered, yet deeply experiential and contemporaneous and passionately shared with people. And it's filled with language, the beauty of holy language. Olivia Sante once said that there's the nomo, the power of the word that generates a reality. It's, the, it's transformative. It speaks with the community and individuals. It's active and it's passive and it's doing all these things at one time. That the community understands what we're talking about. It's a remix because we're remembering something that someone else has said a long time ago. And we're playing with text. Gardner Taylor said it this way, preaching is to seek and find God's movement in human affairs and to cry out passionately, pointing to where the stirring, though scarcely even indisputable, resides in the preacher's task, to hear and to suffer deeply with the still, sad music of humanity and then to go off to it in this wonderful gospel of healing and wholeness is a privilege to preach. And sometimes we don't understand what a privilege is unless it's denied to us, which is why I want to talk about black women. In 1782, an African slave named Belinda filed a petition in the Boston court for judgment against her master for money he owed her, and five years later, with a Philadelphia magazine published, The Cruelty of Men Whose Faces Were Like the Moon, a petition of an African slave to the legislature of Massachusetts, to the Honorable Senate. And it says that in her petition, she should have won. And they gave her the judgment. And because of her petitioning for what was owed her, it was the first kind of movement that black women were able to do out in public. And following that, there were all kinds of non-religious kind of writings with Phyllis Wheatley and some other people, but black women began doing what was called a spiritual narrative. Sometimes they could write, sometimes they wouldn't, but names like Julia Foote and Jarena Lee and Amanda Berry Smith and Vivian Broughton and Sojourner Truth all followed the same format that Belinda is using. When we look at what their sermons contain, their spiritual narratives now, they were concerned with socioeconomics. They were concerned with leveling the hierarchies that existed around them. 
they use wordplay. Now, as a person that loves words, I'm right with the sisters right there. There's something beautiful about language. They, they blended genres. They, they, just, they, they, they wanted to talk about the transgressions. Uh, they were prophetic. They, they were fighting against persecution. There was a preoccupation, however, with praise and gratitude, often based on some psalmist's tradition. There was excessive use of, a, of echo and hyperbole. But any way they did it, they wanted to express how they felt about God even when nobody wanted to hear them. They were called unnatural women, blues women, who challenged hegemonic systems of race and gender and were sometimes read out of the church because of it. They were unnatural too because they didn't conform to what womanhood was supposed to be. They didn't conform to what everybody else thought women should be. Jean-Jacques Rousseau defined uh, French citizens uh, and something we follow in this country as the male heads of household, that women's place was in the house. She could lend the heart and enable men to run legislation. There was something called, uh, uh, let me give you a quote from Rousseau, a witty, meaning articulate, woman is a scourge to her husband to her children and to her friends, her servants, and to all the world. Elated by the sublimity of her genius, she scorns to stoop to the duties of a woman and is sure to become a man." End quote. Seems like we hear that in 2015. She was supposed to be the Republican mother. I'm not talking about Donald Trump and his crew. I'm talking about Republican mother. And this was someone who was responsible to raise the children, and raise men particularly so that they could run the legislature, the public sphere. But there was something about black women that people forgot, is that black women were not these women. They were supposed to, women were supposed to be pious, dependent on doing things at home, the pretty gentlewoman in the north and lady in the south. And most of their conversions, the spiritual narratives came out of a near-death experience. They were supposed to be pure. Women were supposed to be up on a pedestal. My mama said, be careful who put you on a pedestal because they can knock you out. But a pedestal, adorned for men. They were supposed to be perpetual virgins. That's why women have children every two or three years, so that way they wouldn't have affairs with other people. Too bad it didn't happen today. <laughs> they could be divorced. Most of them had four, five, ten children. They were supposed to be submissive. This is how we get mixed up in our theology sometimes. The male was superior. The woman needed to be protected. She was a weaker sex. Men never had menstruation, so they didn't understand what weaker sex really meant. <laughs> and they were supposed to be domestic, being able to take everything. Black women, however, didn't share this kind of true womanhood. These women had to work. These women raised other people's children. These women were out in the sphere. They were kind of like Audre Lorde's sister outsider, that they were under the dangers of the tyrannies of silence, that they didn't conform when people thought they had to conform because they were trying to survive. So listen to the words of one of the sisters. I did not speak much until I reached my 42nd year. Can you imagine waiting 42 years to preach? When it was revealed to me that the message that was given to me, I could not yet deliver and the time had come. And, I could, and, and as I could read but a little, I questioned within myself, was it possible for me to deliver the message when I didn't understand the scriptures? While I struggled, there seemed to be a light from heaven to fall upon me that banished all my fears. And I was unable to form a new resolution, not by commission of men's hands. If the Lord had ordained me, I needed nothing better. This was Elizabeth, who started preaching when she was 42 in 1808. She preached for 50 years in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Didn't know if she should preach because human beings said she couldn't put it off for all that time, yet when God spoke, she had no choice but to preach. Over the past two centuries, thousands of black women like Elizabeth 
have been named and unnamed Zamanis, Aunt Janes, priestesses, church mothers, missionaries, spiritual centers, prayer warriors, evangelists, preachers, and they've struggled internally and externally with what it means to take God's word to the world. Teetering between life-affirming oration and death-dealing silence, black women have, cha- have, have faced charges and challenges and critiques, but they couldn't get away from what God told them. They wrote these spiritual autobiographies and often used Joel 2, 28 and 29, or 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35 as support for their calls. And what we find is often when women were told not to preach, they had some kind of conversion experience or near-death experience or God spoke to them. And when they said, the Spirit told me, people left them alone. That's when people didn't try to order the Spirit and run the Spirit. They understood what the Spirit was. There was a strong relationship between the biblical text, despite the the oppressive use. Their calls are manifest by spiritual anointing and gifting. The text about God's Spirit being poured out on all humanity was perceived as a mandate from God to go articulate the word and take it to everyone. Jarena Lee, that instance, it appeared to me as if a garment which had entirely enveloped my whole person, even to my finger ends, split at the crown of my head and was stripped away from me, passing like a shadow from the night when the glory of God covered me. Then she goes on a few years later. I told them I was like Jonah for it had been there nearly eight years since the Lord had called me to preach his gospel to the fallen sons and daughters of Adam's race, but that I had lingered like him and delayed to go at the bidding of the Lord and warn those who were deeply guilty, as were the people of Nineveh. I feared it might be called. I should be expelled from the church, but instead of this, the bishop, Richard Allen, rose up in the assembly and related that I had been called upon him eight years before, asking to be permitted to preach and that he had put me off. But he now as much believed that I had been called to the work as to preachers of the present. Now let me tell you what the girlfriend did. A service was going on and uh, she understood the text very well and a service was going on and the brother wasn't quite on point that was preaching. And she stood up in the middle of the sermon and started preaching the text. And people were confounded. But it was because it was a move of the Spirit that then even when someone said the discipline didn't say women could do that, they had to leave it alone. Because the Spirit trumps the discipline, I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just saying. saying. The bishops know I'm crazy, so y'all can go ahead and tell them I'm... So in 1819, she receives this blessing from Richard Allen and begins to preach. And one of my favorite quotes from her, for as unseemly as it may appear nowadays for a woman to preach, it should be remembered that nothing is impossible with God. Indeed, it would be even improbable that God, it is not even improbable that God would call a woman to preach. And so she stepped away from that Republican mother kind of thing. She, she left her two children with Richard Allen. She was widowed and she walked up and down the East Coast preaching 2,700, excuse me, going 2,700 miles in one year and preaching 137 sermons because God told her to do it. Jarena Lee, Maria Stewart, Zilpha Elaw, Nancy Prince were evangelists, missionaries, itinerant ministers living, and they weren't ordained, living in an unholy area of subjugation and poverty. Sometimes other women didn't support women doing this because they were afraid they would look bad. Now, let me just say right now that when I started in ministry, I was under the impression that men were the only ones that didn't want me to preach. Hmm. If a church is 70 to 95% women and their money runs the church, then somebody should figure out that it's not just the brothers saying you can't preach, that women have a large voice in church And they were saying, I don't want the women to preach. But the Spirit again gives utterance. Julia Foote. When called of God on a particular occasion to a definitive work, I said, Lord, not me. Did anybody in the room ever say, Lord, not me? All right, this is on your street, okay. 
day by day I was more impressed that God would have a work for me in his vineyard. And I thought it could not be me that was called to preach. I am so weak and ignorant. Still, I knew that all things were possible with God. You see, that keeps coming up. Even to confounding the wise by foolish things of this earth, yet in me there was a shrieking. I took all my doubts and fears to the Lord in prayer when what seemed to be an angel made his appearance and his hand was a scroll on which these words appeared. Thee have I chosen to preach my gospel without delay. The moment I saw it appeared to be printed on my heart. The angel was gone in an instant and I in agony cried out, Lord, I cannot do it. The darkness enveloped me. I had always been opposed to the preaching of women and had spoken against it, though I acknowledged without foundation, this rose before me like a mountain. And when I thought about the difficulties they had to encounter, both from professors and non-professors, I shrank back and said, Lord, I cannot go. And she goes on in her autobiography that says, then God sent a flame that rose up in front of her. And as it opened, she understood what she was supposed to do. Think about your narrative, your call, your story. How dare we let somebody tell us not to do something when God moves in mysterious ways to tell us what we're called to do. Other women have to leave the denomination. They leave their family, they become missionaries. Amanda Berry Smith, began preaching in 1869. And she was AME at the time but, and preached for eight years but was not being ordained. So she began to travel to evangelize the world. She was called the singing pilgrim or the colored evangelist. And she, she preached in the South and the West. She received constant calls for meetings and she wound up going to India and was a missionary in India. These unnatural women, these unnatural women knew that even as they stepped out of their place, God wanted them to take the word to the world. They had a collective experience. They knew about ritual. They knew storytelling. They believed in solidarity. And they knew that sexism was not of God. They made way for someone like a Maria Stewart, who became the first African-American woman to lecture about women's rights and black women's rights, the first one to speak in public with a mixed audience of men and women. And let me just say that the early nar uh, narratives that we're talking about, these women and their spiritual narratives, they always spoke between black and white crowds, that they were that powerful that all kinds of people came. There wasn't this division that we seem to love in this particular era. Maria Stewart gave such fantastic kinds of public speaking that she had to stop speaking in public under threat of death. Weary throats and new songs. Black denominations began ordaining women in 1884. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, but he was sanctioned in 1888 and they had to take back the ordinations of the two women because General Conference said nope. Um, but we catch up a little bit later. So traditionally, the black denominations that first affirm the call, and I, I always find it very interesting when people say the Baptists don't ordain women. The National Baptist Convention ordained a woman in 1895. The Pentecostal Holiness in 1895. They were followed then by the AME Zion Church, African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in 1898. The AME Church ordained women deacons in 1948 and the elders in 1960 and the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in 1966. The Church of God in Christ did not ordain women as elders and pastors and bishops. Men were supposed to preach, women were supposed to teach. However, many churches were started because when the husband died, the woman took over and did the church anyway. See, God sometimes will move folks out of the way. <laughs> just, just trying to tell you, just don't mess with God. <laughs> All right. And then there were still critiques at all of this of what women were doing. In 1921, one of my predecessors wrote about silly women masquerading in the name of religion. The horde of irresponsible evangelists and women in religious garb 
bearing different names or attaining such proportions that pastors should refuse to recognize them. As a rule, they can sing and are glib with a slangy harangue, which may be create a temporary attraction from the crowd. This particular editor of the AME Review thought that the women were distracting from what men were doing and they should be at home. Then as now, women are still responding to their, their call because even under the charges of feminizing the church and taking jobs away from men, women are still preaching the word. In Weary Throats of New Songs, I attempted to explore the ways, the hows and whys of contemporary black women proclaiming God's word. I sent out uh, 485 questionnaires with 15 questions to 41 states and 30 denominations and received 116 back. I asked them about how were they called to preach? When did they know they were called to preach? Who were their mentors? What did authority mean to them? How did they prepare sermons? What were their preaching passion? How did they deliver? And even what they wore. Because at that time, there was a belief that women should not have makeup on. Okay, so let me tell you about my Board of Examiners experience. I love clothes. Because I grew up with two pair of shoes, one for Sunday school and one to play in, and you shouldn't tear up either one of them. And I had the outfit for during the week and then the Sunday outfit. And so my father said, if you learn to sew, you can wear whatever you want to. So I learned to sew. So I go to the board of examiners, that's where they examine ministers, and I was told I had to wear all black. And I was also told at the time my hair was down here that I had to pull my hair back in a bun because I didn't want to tempt the men on the board. And so my grandmother raised me to be a little mouthy. So, so I thought, it's not my problem that they can't concentrate. This is my hair. Right. And so uh, I was in Denver, Colorado, where I was going to the board. I was the first woman in the 144-year history of the, uh, you know, the, to be in that particular era to go through ministry. And so they said I had to wear black and I had to take my nail polish off because I changed my nail polish every day because you got to look sharp when you go out, right? And I like shoes. Imelda Marcos has nothing on me. I like shoes. <laughs> so I didn't want to wear those ugly little, they said I couldn't wear high heels. So they wanted me to look like a little pigeon or something. And so my rebuttal to everything was I wore red underwear. <laughs> Sometimes you got to make your breakthrough just for you. That's all I want to say. <laughs> all right. But I got through the board of examiners and I'm ordained an elder today. But sometimes you just have to do little, little, little protests. I just want to, I don't know why I shared that. I don't know where that came from, but, <laughs> but you have it now. So, so tell people that's what I did because they didn't know, but, uh, because you don't really, okay, never mind. All right. <laughs> Black women in their preaching, I found out, in doing the research in Weary Throats, and I was very careful not to take their words and make them my words. Because what I found that often happened to people is they editorialize what you say. You know those meetings where you say one thing and then somebody says, what you meant to say? And that's not what you meant to say, but they take your words. And so in my research, what I did was I let their words stand. So whatever they sent me, I took those and put them in the book so that people would not hear Teresa's voice other than to, to set things up, but you would actually hear the voices of women because for too many centuries, somebody spoke through us like we were spiritual Muppets. And so I didn't want that to happen. And so what I found is they were doing the same thing that black men were doing in preaching, but they were doing so in a feminine voice. Even though there was an error for black men preachers, they were told they had to preach like men or they wouldn't be accepted. And so part of what I do is try to have people understand their own voice and preach like they are. And so they don't ever have, because God didn't call me to be anyone but me. And so I don't like clone kind of preachers. And so in the research, I didn't want everybody to be a clone and sound like me. I wanted to hear their voices. And so the basic kinds of things, are just what you hear in male preaching, is that there's one God and God is present. That you have your own way of interpreting that you have to be led by the Holy Spirit, that there's a rootage in orality, that you need to know the language, that there's a way you use the words. Words have power, but words are so beautiful and important. And when we move from using the oral kind of language into the written language, we lose something. Many of my students today, I find, say they have no imagination because everything's presented for them on the screens. 
And so their sermons don't have very much depth to them because they can't get in the text and walk around it and see things because they're used to somebody else giving them the images. And so the orality is there, that it's a dance religion, which means you embody what you're talking about, which is you, you don't have to run back and forth like Serena Williams on the tennis court, but some way you use your language that people can have a multi-sensory experience while you're preaching, that they can hear the text, that they can see the text, that they can smell the text, that they can move in the text, that they can touch the text. And that makes the sermon so much more beautiful because the word is supposed to be alive, but too many people have killed the word. And so nobody, who wants to come and hear a dead word on Sunday morning? And so it's, it's, it's this dance kind of religion. It's, it's melodious and it's spontaneous and it's narrative and it's experiential. Gardner Taylor said, people want to know you've been with Jesus. And too many things become a lecture on Sunday morning. Too many things become some self-satisfying word that you're going to tune everybody else out with because you think they're going to hell and not you. And so it's, it's that kind, that's not on my paper, but that's how I preach anyway. And that the biblical text is important. These women started out, as I said, using Joel and Corinthians because they wanted people to know that it's not their word, but it's God's word. And so with this return these last few years to biblical preaching, that maybe our theology will become more sound and people trust the word and not us because we're human and we're going to fail. But there's something in that biblical text, no matter how you're using it, that speaks more volumes than we can ever have. Our minds are not big enough to do that. And we kind of try to trump the the mystery of God when it's just our word. And so biblical text becomes central to this kind of preaching that the women are doing in this time. And so from that, I'm trying to stay within, how much time do I have? No, that that was not a good answer because I... (laughs) Once I get going, I can go for hours. I just, if I didn't have this paper in front of me, I'd be real good, but it's a... Um, so one of the things in, in studying these women's lives, um, in knowing what the church culture looks like, in going through a process where uh, there were times when I was invited up to preach in a pulpit, and other times I had to stand down on the floor. Uh, when my grandmother died, when my mother died, my mother's Baptist, I'm AME. My mother died, um, left the general conference in 2000 to go to do my mother's funeral. My sister calls me, we're on our way down I-20 from St. Louis to Kansas City. She said, Teresa, you can't be in the pulpit. Because I'd gone through many years of having to stand down here because women menstruate, the feeling was that if we stood in the pulpit, we would defile the pulpit. I told somebody, look, I had a hysterectomy, so it shouldn't be a problem. (laughs) I was impressed, but they didn't know her. (laughs) And so I said, okay. So I get to the church the morning of the funeral. It's my mother, you understand. I get to the church the morning of the funeral. My grandparents were Baptists, you know, and um, my mother's beer is here, and they had a podium and a microphone at the foot of my mother's casket, and they sent the deacons to set up in the pulpit to make sure I wouldn't go up there. So I stood next to my mother's casket and preached the word because all ground is holy ground. So why should I give over power God has given me by fighting for a chair that doesn't fit my behind anyway? Okay. Sorry. I'm going to be academic again. I just had a moment. Just had a moment. And so it's also trying to talk with people about evangelizing is not the position and place you are, it's the word that comes out of you. So if we're preaching for God, why are we letting people locate us in a power source when the power comes from God? So why do we fight about it? And so one of the things I did in talking to the women when I was doing Weary Throws, but also some of my students, was about 11, 12 years ago, we start working on a womanist homiletic, which was using a way which contemporary black women, I felt, could construe preaching 
from the lens of a black woman and not just be for black women, but other women could also do this. So I've published a couple of different kind of aspects of this, so I'm going to roll through a little bit and then we'll have some conversation. So cognizant of the impact of racism and sexism and classism and ageism and denominationalism in the black church in general and what had happened social historically with black women, uh, in, eight, in 1985, there were a group of black religious scholars who got together and adapted Alice Walker's, that's why I began with Sugar Avery, Alice Walker's definition of womanism. Using uh, bits and pieces of Walker's In Search of Our Mother's Garden, womanist prose, and uh, then selecting pieces that would fit you. Kelly Brown Douglas, a theologian, says, as black women resist the multidimensional oppression based on their experience of being black and female in the United States without the privileges afforded to white women, these women fight for the rights of all women affirming their own womanhood. And let me be real clear, because whenever I start talking about womanists and people think that means we hate men, no. It means that I need to speak as me. I can't speak as a man. I can only speak as a black woman. I can't speak as a white woman. I can only speak as a black woman. And that's all it is, is I'm talking about God. I'm talking about preaching through the lens that fits me. So you have your own lens. So please don't think I'm trying to be antagonistic when I say this. And please don't try to be a womanist, because if you haven't walked in a black woman's pumps, you cannot. <laughs> the seminal work of womanist ethicist Katie Cannon and womanist theologian Jacqueline Grant, among others, expanded by Stacey Floyd Thomas in Mining the Mother Lode and in Deeper Shades of Purple, Womanism and Religion and Society, writes that womanists are concerned with the mental, physical, social dimension of black women's real, real, excuse me, real lived epistemology, and that it's not about being an ivory tower and above, it means the totality of black women's experiences. So the foundation that I use. Womanist ethicist, ethicist and preacher Katie Cannon defines it this way that black women take the biblical text and try to get rid of the conventional stereotypes about women, the sin-bearing Eve, the hen-pecking Jezebel, the prostituting Mary Magdalene, the conspiring Sapphira. That we get, used, get rid of androcentric language, which means that we do more than just he, 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 or it, it, it. That every now and then there's some feminine language in the Bible, so you start looking at, you unearth what black people, what preachers say about women, particularly black women, and what they are also saying about men. That you look at the historical contributions of African-American women that are developed in black church tradition, and then you look at the moral life of the community and how we can speak to that. That we understand that we too are vital oral vessels of God's word. Renita Weems says that when black women start looking at the biblical text, this is a uh, Hebrew Bible scholar, Renita Weems Espinoza, that we look at the Bible, so quote, the oppressed are liberated, the last become first, the humble are exalted, the despised are deferred, preferred, excuse me, those rejected are welcomed, the long suffering are rewarded, and the dispossessed are repossessed, and the arrogant are prostrated. And so in the, in the black community, the Bible becomes important, so there are women in the Bible also. And so why do they always have to be Jezebels and whores? Weren't there women doing something else? And so you look at all the characters, there are like 170 women named in the biblical text and about 30, 3,100 men with names. Now, I think there were more than 107 women in the world. They made those men. And so, <laughs> gotta keep up with me, gotta keep up with me. <laughs> and so it's, it's just being able to speak for yourself. And, and so these are the features, so we'll have time for questions. So I'm gonna skip ahead with what I have down here. A woman is homiletic. And I'm going through the parts of this. A womanist homiletic uh, is filled with radical subjectivity. That means that the preacher continues to do the faith work even in the face of resistance and denial and ostracism. That you have to keep doing your work like the women in the 1800s understood, even if people don't show up. If you're the only one there, you have God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. That's a whole congregation, and you don't even have to worry about an offering, right? And so you keep doing the work. The content infers that one is to speak the truth even in the face of the oppressor. There's something in black community called sitting on a sermon. When you don't like the one that was chosen to preach because you didn't get the call, that people sit like this. 
They yawn. They won't say amen. Well, that happens a lot because they don't understand that people after the first three or four minutes you're preaching get past a whole lot of stuff, particularly if you're preaching the word. They don't care what you look like as long as you're doing what's good, that you're sound in what's going on. And so you have to preach no matter what. Your text is to raise the consciousness, not to always give apologies about, oh, I'm a woman. I know you don't want to hear this because of my voice. No, just preach anyway. We should be preaching more hell out of people than complaining about what people are doing. The preacher has an obligation to instruct the listeners in defining and interpreting and solving contemporary issues in life that overwhelm the people. In life in the preaching moment, there are times that we may erect partitions, but we're supposed to try not to. So we ask ourselves in this radical subjectivity, who's being marginalized, who's being insulted, who's being demeaned by the sermon context? And we balance the spoken word with the political aims of the sermon. Then there's something called traditional communalism. One of my early mentors was Prathia Hall, and she had something called freedom faith that she wrote about. And Prathia said, it's the belief that God intends us to be free and assists us and empowers us in the struggle for freedom. It's understanding that the purpose of the sermon is to heal from the inside out. Think about all the people that get bound up every week by sermons, and we're trying to guilt them into something because we just set ourselves up as judge, jury, and executioner. And it says someplace that all have sinned and come short, but some preachers think they never do. And so they dump stuff on the congregation without understanding those are our brothers and sisters. So we're enchaining people more than freeing people with our words. Dr. Cheryl Townsend joke said, within black congregations, bad preaching is unforgivable sin. <laughs> bad preaching means that the content never addresses the lives of the listeners. Bad preaching is more performance than purposeful imperatives and suggestions about how to live faithfully in the world. The preacher is not to perform, but to name what God wants us to do and help us with language for what God wants us to do to live out these lives. The preacher through the sermon seeks with the oral tradition to remind the people of the culture, to remind the people of compassion, to remind the people of hope, not to send them out more wounded than they came in. I had a friend that once said that preachers are the only people that will shoot the wounded and rub salt in their wounds. This is supposed to be a healing word. You can convict people, but please try to give them something on the way home without killing them. Redemptive self-love is the third point. My language is free your mind and the rest will follow. You can tell how old I am. It means that you start thinking for yourself. It's a celebration, affirmation of self-care and love of humanity. I am convinced that some preachers hate people. It's not even about race or gender. They just don't like people and their preaching shows it. But if we have redemptive self-love that, you know, it says you should love the Lord, you know, um, I am the Lord thy God and you should, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. I think we should love ourselves first, then love neighbor. I want to edit the gospel. Yeah, I know. But I think it's important to love yourself so then you can love other people. Because someplace else in the book it says, how can you tell me you love me when you don't love your brother and sister? Well, most of us hate ourselves and we push that off in sermons on other people. Okay? All right. Yeah, let me skip off. Critical engagement means that we live in anticipation and hope. Black women use something called emancipatory knowledge where we read and reread the biblical text to obtain a personal empowerment so that we can face those justice systems. Mitzi Smith, in a fabulous book called I Found God in Me, a woman, womanist biblical hermeneutics reader, says that womanist biblical hermeneutics prioritize communal, excuse me, communal, in particular lived experience, histories, and artifact of black women and other women of the color as a point of departure and a focal point. It means that we strive to learn from as many different people as we can, we eliminate the boxes that come out in sermons sometimes, that we live imaginatively about what life can really be and not what everybody else tells us life is supposed to be, that we examine and re-examine the biblical text and the life text and the life text. I think we can fail either way. We can study life too much and not study the biblical text, and we can study the biblical text too much and never think about life, which makes both of them irrelevant in the hearer. 
when I go around the country and I do workshops with people and, and lay people tell me that they think that sometimes it's not that the person's a bad preacher but the sermons are irrelevant which means that the, that the pastor is trying to be prophetic but is never pastoral and in my eye you have to be pastoral and care about the people before you can be prophetic just a thought language means a lot when one preaches I'm always amazed at women who have been kept out of pulpits that use exclusionary language. That never think that they should use language that includes everybody in the room. That uh, we preach sermons sometimes on Mother's Day as if everybody in the room had a good relationship with their mother. Or we preach sermons on Father's Day as if all fathers are bad. We have to be broader than that. Our preachings become too narrow too narrow, too stilted, too vapid, too ugly for people to find life. Wow. It's, it's um, yeah. We have to do a critical reflection. It means we have to do some deep work, some deep work with the people and the, the, the biblical text. Appropriation and reciprocity is spirit love. Zora Neale Hurston said that her mother said that she wanted her children to jump at the sun at every opportunity. You might not land on the sun, but at least you'll get off the ground. That means that sometimes in our preaching, and black women did this early on and do it still, go back to the thoughts in those little proverbs that your parents told you that you find you're living right now and do common sense wisdom. As a scholar, sometimes I am bored listening to scholars because they forget practical life. They prefer, my, my, my grandfather had this saying that you can be book smart and common sense dumb. I cleaned it up because my grandfather didn't go to church. <laughs> but there's sometimes we just have to sit with the people and do common sense kind of understandings of what, and stop trying to impress everybody with the big words that we know. Just think of a proverb that was told to you, a community saying when you were growing up and you can see it now in action. That's the kind of work that you do. You have the biblical text and the scholarly work with common sense instead of something that's so ethereal that God can't even reach it. In summary, Patricia Hill Collins, Patricia Hill Collins talks about intellectual activism, that there are themes that knowledge-based things that tear down walls. In my study of black women's preaching, there's spiritual activism, that we try to rid ourselves of the barriers that keep people apart, that we try to live as the women that God created us to be, but above all, the word has primacy in what we are doing. Bell Hooks says, through the cultivation of awareness, to the decolonization of our minds, we have the tools to break with the dominator model of human social engagement and the will to imagine new and different ways that people might come together. I think that from the call of God, we have tools to do this. A womanist homiletic of the 21st century proclaimers means the utilization of a liberative discourse of God's people with metamorphic boldness. Preachers must step out of the status quo and seek sermonic language and content that shakes dungeons and makes chains fall off. The womanist homiletic means that sermons are well-researched, statistically correct, exegetically sound, fact, fiction, topical sermons on justice and love and humanity and liberation and responsibility. That we try to speak now and not wait until everybody is dead against the power dynamics that exist in our churches and our society that we talk about more than just drug abuse and racism, that sometimes we need to talk about ego problems and militarism and prison industrial and domestic violence and heterosexism and disease. We are voices of resistance and we can continue the work with some kind of dignity if we answer the call God has given us, stand even when they don't want us to stand, are true to the biblical text, and as Shakespeare might say, to your own self, be true. Thank you.
I'm told we have 10 minutes in case anybody has a question. And my only thing is make sure it's not your dissertation. Just ask a brief question um, and we'll try to uh, answer as best we can. If not, I'll ask somebody in the crowd to answer. Yes, if you can come to the microphone. They've asked that you come to the microphone if you have a question. I'm speaking with <coughs> parishioners uh, in the room, so I have to be careful what I say. Uh -huh. I'm one of these preachers, I'm not as young as your students, who just, I look at the text, I do all my exegetical work, and I say, I have no imagination, I have no story, I got nothing, I've got nothing to, how do I access my life, my story, my whatever, to free that up? You said you have nothing? Yeah, that's what I always feel. I, I do all Let me ask you this, what do you think imagination is? Mm picturing things in a new way, like uh, imagination. It's playing with ideas in a new way, a way I hadn't thought of before. Okay. Um, when did you start preaching? I was young, 20, nah, uh, 27. That's what you wanted to be when you grew up? No, no. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Took a lot of imagination to get the way you are. <laughs> What's on your wrist? A Fitbit. Okay. And I want you to look at your Fitbit and tell me how that could be a faith object. Uh, let's see. Um, I have to wear this every day mm -hmm. to remind myself that I am intentional, that I want to. I want to get my body moving. It's not good for me to sit all the time. I should mm -hmm. be moving around somewhat. Okay. Is there some text that talks about caring for your body? Uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Guess what you just did? Just gave me an illustration for temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we do is we look too far out for what we're going to use for our illustration when it's right with you. Mm -hmm. It's in your breathing, it's in things you do during the day that you don't know because you're a human being. Other people are doing the same thing in a different place. Yeah. So maybe you're trying too hard to imagine. Yeah. Mm. Or you've listened to other people. Sometimes you listen to other people's sermons and they yeah, just seem so, so phenomenal. Eloquent. Oh my goodness, that was so good. Yeah. But maybe because God called you, God called you with the way you talk about it. So accept that you call God, God called you the way you talk about it. Yeah, I like that. I like when you said that before. Like, this is God calling. This is who I am. This is what I've got. And we know God had sense enough to call us. We may not have answered at the right time, but God called us. Because someone in some context, because preaching is a particular word for particular people at a particular time in a particular place. Mm. And nobody else can do what you do. Mm. So do you. Okay. Thank you. My question is concerning voice, mm -hmm. and you spoke about that, and um, being a woman pastor and preacher, uh, finding that voice mm -hmm. and uh, from how we preach or, or com being coming comfortable, how do you teach your students how to find that voice? Wrote a little book about it. <laughs> <laughs> I do I'll actually have a book about it. <laughs> um, one of the things I think that I have found is a barrier to people accepting their voices because we have these standards out about what a good voice is. Right. Uh, can you tell me what Jesus' voice sounded like? <laughs> no, I cannot. Okay. Could you tell me how Paul sounded? I can tell you how Paul sounds to me. Ah. But you don't know exactly how Paul sounds. No, I do not. But we have these images of people with these sonorous smooth, wonderfully convincing voices, and that becomes the standard. Or whoever the person is that has the biggest crowd becomes the standard. Yes. But just like I told my sister right here, there's someone that can only attend to your voice. And we, we too often try to imitate somebody else's voice because it looks like they have more followers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. But 
first name? Oh, Stacy. Stacy. Nobody in the world has Stacy's voice. As a speech pathologist, I taught people about voice. And um, everybody's vocal folds, same size, size of a dime. It's the coverage, or it's the muscles and the cartilage and all those other kinds of things, the thickness of the folds, it's the change in how you breathe. So if you want to improve your voice, that's one thing. Okay. But your voice is more than what we hear verbally. It's more than the vocalizations. Your voice is also the way your body moves. Your voice is also where you make pauses. Your voice is also your intonations. Your voice is when you get excited, whether it breaks up or breaks down. Okay. And the people become acclimated to the voice, which is why, since we're, in a, we're an appointment system, when a new pastor comes in, part of it's grief, but part of it is they have to get used to your voice. Doesn't mean they don't like your voice, it means they've heard this other voice for 75 years, now all of a sudden this other voice comes <laughs> All right, this other voice comes in, all right? And so it's even the way you put sermons together becomes part of your preaching voice. So I know it sounds repetitious, but that's the hardest thing for people to do to say, this is, this is the way I sound. So unless you have something organic going on with your voice or a functional voice, it's yours. And so you need to accept it. And also understand that when you listen to yourself on, on tape, uh, you know, a recording, it's not going to sound the same way because the voice, the sound is going out here and it's not muffled by all, your, all the cartilage and everything else in your head. So your voice may sound higher, it may sound lower, it may sound a little scratchy or whatever, but the people get used to it. And after a while, when people listen to you for a long time, they don't hear the voice dysfunction, you do. Okay? Yes. Second half of that question yes. is, um, with voice and with preaching style, maybe mm -hmm. that's the difference, maybe mm -hmm. I'm looking at two, uh, is there a certain type of style like or how you preach or what you preach from like I I'm a love person I deal a lot with love that's called your preaching passion passion maybe that's what if I'm I if I had time and went around this room and I asked people to think about what they preach and there's going to be a, a, a core little element whether you're preaching teaching whatever that comes up in everything you do that's your preaching passion that's yours. That's your heart work. Okay. Mine is social justice. Mm -hmm. So I can be doing a psalm and I'll find some social justice thing that comes in there. And pe if I don't, people will say, are you sick today? Okay. <laughs> and so, because it, it naturally, it's what you're, it's what you're, it's what you're drawn to. Okay? okay. So the challenge is every now and then to preach something different. Mm -hmm. Because just like if we use the very same style all the time or the very same sermon form all the time, or the very same timing or the way we dress, then people start turning off and they can time when you're going to get to certain things. Mm -hmm. And then That's they become time. too used to hearing your voice. So you can change styles and you can change forms. So people go, oh, she didn't do that before. Let me listen. Oh. Okay. That's good to know because I do do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so, so just try that every now and then because if not, they'll go, you know, they know when to come in. They know when to wake up. Oh, yeah. They know when to start gathering their children up. They call a nursery. You know they're right about here. So go. They know when to make the restaurant reservations on Sunday because you do the same thing every week. So part of all that style and voice is to change up. Throws people off. And if you're a person that only stays in Old Testament, try some New Testament stuff. And for goodness sake, this is the last little thing because I know I'm going on. I always tell my students, if there is a text that worries you that you don't ever preach because you don't like it, preach it. It will do wonders for your soul. Amen. Mine was, was because I grew up in a Baptist church, excuse me, all Baptists. I grew up in a Baptist church in Missouri, which means you knew the Bible inside and out. We had Bible Bowl, vacation Bible school. We were at church every blessed day of the week. I didn't know people played on Saturday because we're still at church. And, Every Women's Day, what was the script for every Women's Day? Proverbs 32. I was so tired for that woman, I didn't know what to do because she was surely dead. But this is what education would do for you. I researched the text and found out the background of the text. Then I was able to preach it as a black woman living in America, not a whole conglomeration of women 
that were in the text. And I was able to do it by not telling people, you've been wrong all these years. But let me give you a different view of the text, which may help somebody, because too many women are trying to be all the attributes and don't understand how that came together. See, something as simple as Women's Day, we're killing women by saying you got to get up in the morning, you got to have your goods at the gate, city gate, you got to put the money in the bank, you don't have to change clothes, you got to cook, you got to scrub, you got to birth baby, nurse them while you're doing everything. So sometimes we can oppress people by the way we handle things in this style. So get that text that you don't like, and then also preach the whole text. Don't just preach Psalm 139 and just jam off of that. We have hung our harps on the tree. How can we sing the Lord's song and forget about the babies being smashed at the bottom? <laughs> okay. So do some good work with the exegesis and your sermons will be better and your sermon life opens up and you don't have to say, I don't have anything to preach. If you're in my class right now, every one of you would be preaching right now. Because everybody, whether you answer a call to preach or not, has a sermon in you that's been living forever. All right? Thank you. Thank you. I told you I could go. I told you not to do this. <laughs> All right. We're done? Thank you so much. I've been up since 4.30 Atlanta time. So thank you for hanging with me. <laughs> <laughs>